Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball Today, and welcome to Pitcher Week. Frank Scott and Chris all here on Monday, February 19th. Today on the show, it's our starting pitcher preview part one. Lots of setting the stage. We'll break down league-wide trends, what happened with pitching last year, what you needed to compete in Roto Leagues, each of our approaches to starting pitchers this year, and then we'll try and get through the top 20 or so in ADP. Let's just jump right in. Uh, and first... Let's take a step back. 2022, a clear outlier uh, for starting pitchers, likely due to some version of a dead in baseball, which suppressed home runs in 2023. Things changed. MLB implemented new rules, shift restrictions, the pitch clock, bigger bases. It was all done with the intent to generate more organic offense. And that's exactly what it did. League wide starting pitcher ERA jumped from 4.05 in 2022 to 445 in 2023. League-wide whip went from 126 to 131. With those numbers listed, and that being said, Chris, how did that affect what you needed to compete in ERA and whip uh, in the ERA and whip categories in Roto Leagues last year? I believe you have the data for both 12-team and 15-team leagues. Yeah, I, what I don't have is 2022 data to compare it to, but I do have for 2021. So last year, the number one team, in Roto Leagues last year uh, in 12-team CBS Sports Roto Leagues. And this means the team that won the ERA category. So the team that won the ERA category last year on average had a 3 4 five, six ERA. That's a, a nice little fun, uh, you know, I don't know what that's called, four numbers in a row, whatever. <laughs> in 2021, it was three two eight. So about two tenths of a run higher. Whip last year, 1.15 in 2020. 21 it was 1.1 sixth and seventh place so right in the middle was 3.937 3.997 in 2023 in 2021 377 384 so again about two tenths to 0.15 runs better in 2021 than 2023 in a 15 team league first place was 3.578 this is based on NFBC main event leagues. Um, the middle point there was above four. So what that should tell you is all of a sudden last year, a four ERA, it wasn't helping your fantasy team, but it wasn't a disaster in the way that it might've been viewed for a pretty long time. And that is a, a pretty significant shift. Now, obviously, you're not aiming for a four ERA, but like I, I think when you're looking at this, you know, I, I wrote this piece, it's on cbsports.com. Here's what you need to win every rotisserie category. I think you should always think about winning third place. If you win third place in every category, there's a pretty good chance you're going to win your league. The average first place team finished in around third place in every category. So to win third place last year, 378 was the fourth place number. So you needed a 379 ERA to win third place last year. That's pretty high. And I think that fits in with everything we've talked about since last season, how, how much that landscape shifted, even though it wasn't like the juiced ball era. It was a different kind of mm -hmm. thing. It wasn't just everybody giving up home runs and, what really made last year stand out, and we're going to talk a lot about this, was how bad the early round pitchers were as a whole. It was, I just looked at the last five years, but it was by far the last, the worst year for the top 15 starting pitchers in ADP. I have that data if you'd like to hear. Yeah, go for it. Uh, last year, based on the Fangraphs auction calculator, the top 15 starting pitchers taken Averaged $3.7 in value. What? That is because six of the top 15 provided negative value, including like, gotcha. gosh. Uh, like guys that got hurt too, though, right? Some guys got hurt. Jacob DeGrom was top 15. Sandy Alcantara was a negative player last year because wow. he pitched so many innings with such a bad ERA. Um, compare that to the previous four years. This is not including 2020 because I, I just don't look at 2020 when I'm doing these kind of analysis. So 2020, 20, 22, 21, 19, and 18. 
no more than five of the top 15 provided negative value in any year of those four. And the average value was at least $9.5 for the top 15 every year before last year, when again, it was $3.7. So Hmm. it was a pretty disastrous season for the most expensive pitchers in fantasy in 2023. And that makes sense. Hi guys. Scott White here, (laughs) and that makes sense because of all the land, all all the rule changes you were talking about, Frank. Where what was different now, twenty twenty three? Why pitching suffered in twenty twenty three? What what was different about it from like twenty nineteen, the worst of the juice ball era, is that back then you still had really really dominant pitchers because. And you could find really dominant pitchers. Basically, if you got strikeouts, if you kept the ball on the ground, you know, all the runs in the juice ball era were being scored on home runs, basically. So as long as you prevented that, you could you could you could really dominate as a pitcher. But um now runs are being scored in other ways, less predictable ways. And to kind of latch on to what Chris was saying. Um, this was something I tweeted out it on September 6th of last year. So there was still a month of play to go. I'll have to redo the numbers with the full season stats, but basically the season was almost over. I have the, I have the updated numbers by the way, Scott. Okay. I mean, all right, go ahead you, and give them. So, well, first of all, tell me what did you use as the parameters for fantasy points per game? Cause I know that's, that's what you use, right? Yeah. Fantasy points per game. Um, which so, numbers did you use? Like which levels? Okay, well, well, let me just give the numbers I have, and I think it'll make the point. And gotcha, we, don't gotcha. need to, we don't need to. I mean, things could have really changed in the final 24 <laughs> days of the season. So in 2022, five pitchers averaged 19 fantasy points per game or more. 2022, five averaged 19 or more. It's compared to one in 2023. Um, 17 to 18 points. It was 17 in 2022. It was four in 2023. And then 12 to 16 points, so more of like a mid to upper tier at starting pitcher. It was 48 in 2022, 66 in 2023. So everybody kind of receded into something we haven't mentioned yet here in SP Preview 1. It's probably the the longest we've ever gone in a podcast. (laughs) The the glob. Everybody receded into the glob. so, So this is my theory on the glob, and we've kind of made reference we, we've kind of ta- addressed a lot of these points already but so you had rule changes that promoted more base runners with the shift ban promoted more base activity with the pickoff limits the bigger bases etc more, more base runners more runners on the move more stress for the pitcher and then to top it all off you introduced the pitch clock you, you forced them to maintain a high tempo when there was all this stress on the bases. And so what I noticed as I was playing out 2023, what I'm sure a lot of people noticed playing out 2023, is that when things went bad for a pitcher in a start, they tended to go really, really bad. And you saw a lot of these disaster starts. You saw them at all levels of the pitching spectrum, the high-end guys and certainly the, the guys outside of the high end. And But specifically... You know, because the high end guys obviously were capable of really dominant starts still, and it kind of made it so you could live with the disaster starts a little more. But if, if they weren't a high end guy, they were a middle end guy, they were a middle to low end guy, they were in the glob, they basically became random number generators. They might have a great start seven innings, six innings, you know, one run, six strikeouts, or whatever. Great. They might turn around and have eight earned runs the next start. And you just, it became impossible to really anticipate what was going to happen from them. Uh, it was just complete randomness. It destroyed e- <laughs> any pitcher could destroy your team's ERA at the drop of a hat. And it sucked. It sucked. So, um, so that's what I'm talking about when I say the glob, basically this giant mass of 50 or 60 pitchers that from start to start, you really have no idea what's going to happen. Their ERA is, only as good as their last start. At least that's how it played out last year. And so I'm just kind of, my, my approach to starting pitcher this year is just 
okay, I want strikeouts. First of all, if, if you're getting outs without contact, that's hopefully going to prevent base runners in the first place. That'll get you into this mess. But even more than that, the reason I want strikeouts is because strikeouts you can count on. Strikeouts you can bank on. Strikeouts. If a pitcher knows how to get strikeouts, that pitcher's going to get strikeouts unless he's hurt or something. ERA specialists, whip specialists, you know, there are some guys I trust more for ERAs than another, but I don't, to a certain extent, I don't trust it for anybody. And certainly the pitchers in the glob, I don't feel like I can sort out who's going to have a better or worse ERA with any any great accuracy, as long as the environment stays the same. And that's always that's always the caveat, isn't it? Because MLB could change something. Pitchers could just figure out ways to manage the stress better. Like, you know, they've 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 had a year of exposure to it. They're obviously wanting to do their best. And and so maybe, maybe there will be better coping mechanisms for pitchers now. But based on what we saw last year, uh I, I am fearful of the glob and mostly wanting to build my starting pitching around strikeouts as a, as a result. Yeah. And I think that makes a lot of sense, Scott, the numbers that I had were eerily similar to the ones that you presented. I went with starting pitchers with 18 or more fantasy points per game. If you look at the past three years, seven in 2021, eight in 2022, only two in 2023. So again, that elite top tier, it's depleted. It's not as plentiful as it was in 2021 and 2022. If you look at starting pitchers with 16 or more by the end of the season, it was 17 in 2021, 24 in 2022, 10 in 2023. And then uh, starting pitchers between 12 and 16, 37 in 2021, 35 in 2022, 42 in 2023. So those pitchers got pushed down into that mid tier, or as we like to call um, it, the glob. And I think the thing to keep in mind when you're doing that analysis is 2021 was artificially deflated at the high end because so few pitchers were throwing as many innings. You know, that that's one thing that we we talked a lot about is 2021 is is just a dip for starting pitching production overall because of they were coming off the 2020 season. So, yeah, th those numbers are stark and um you know, obviously that's a a points league analysis focus, but you know, you see it in Roto Leagues as well. Using the Fangraphs auction calculator, there were nine starting pitchers who were worth at least $20 last season. In 2023, it was, or 2022, it was 16. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. that's the, it's very, very similar re regardless of what approach you take. Now, there are a lot of questions as to why this is the case and and whether or not you should take a ton from that and and whether because ultimately when we're talking about like even a, a you know like i did earlier the top 15 starting pitchers that's a small sample size and you know that number about the most negative value players well that was two more than most of the other seasons we were talking about and you know it was Shohei or uh, Sandy Alcantara was really bad last season from a fantasy perspective because of how many innings he threw in in a way that was specific to roto leagues. And Spencer Strider really struggled with his ERA in a way that I don't think any of us expect to be the case in 2024. Although maybe you know there, yeah. there are there are things in his profile that suggest he may be a higher ERA pitcher than you might think. But the the what was the stat? The top four starting pitchers by X ERA, expected ERA. Um, I'll I'll look this up. Go ahead and keep talking with your point, Chris. I'll I'll look this up. But there's there's an interesting. Oh well, it, it's that. just it's just to say, like we talked about with the third base preview, where a year ago third base was by far the shallowest position to the point where you could make the case that it was worth stretching for Nolan Arenado into the third round or the second round. If you thought that he was the last third baseman, you know, for the next five rounds worth drafting. And now all of a sudden third base just looks like a normal position again, because we had a handful of breakouts. And, and so it's always, I think worth having in the back of your mind when we have these discussions, this is what happened last year. 
and this all this goes without saying for everything we talk about, but I think it's especially true when we're talking about population level stuff. Just because something happened the previous year doesn't mean it will happen the next year. And, you know, how different does it look if Shane McClanahan doesn't get hurt or, you know, whatever, you know, specific pitcher you want to say who contributed to the the position being shallower at the top end. Um, doesn't change doesn't change the glob though. I mean, sure, the glob is well behind that group, and that's that's what I'm most fearful of. I do think, I do think the 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 standard for an ace has changed, which is kind of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, part of what part of what contributed to that is like Garrett Cole, even though he won Cy Young, he's you know was good enough that we're drafting him in the first round again. Corbin Burns their strikeout rates went down and I don't really have an explanation for that because that the environmental changes shouldn't have changed, shouldn't have impacted that. Maybe a longstanding effect of like the sticky stuff. Well, there, Maybe. there is that. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. every year since they introduced the sticky substance ban, they're saying we're cracking down harder this year. And, um, and they certainly said that at the beginning of last year too. So, I mean, that could be part of what's contributing to the, uh, the reduced the reduction of performance at the the highest level of starting pitching but you know i'm i i don't uh, yeah i i mean i get, i get what chris is saying and he's he's not wrong like maybe it's just a one year phenomenon i think uh with with all of it, with everything that happened at starting pitcher, with the glob and everything, with the with the disaster starts, with the uh, mid level pitchers being random number generators from start to start. I mean, like like I said, pit pitchers may have come up with a way; they may figure out a way to cope with the pitch clock and and all the base activity. I mean, past generations of baseball, there was a lot more base activity than during the juice ball era. It was kind of like a return to an old standard there. So um, obviously pitchers have figured out how to navigate that environment before. But, but I do but think, Oh, sorry. It was a major, there were rule changes contributing to all the, all the, like we, we always ask going into a season with a lot of rule changes, what is this going to mean? Well, we saw what it meant. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that, that's the reality I feel like I have to operate in now. Maybe reality will be diff look different next year because of what happened in 2024, but I, I can only go with what I've seen so far, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, let's take our first break. Before we do that, just some quick reminders to sign up for the FBT newsletter at cbssports.com slash newsletters. Click on the FBT logo, punch in your email address. It's easy as that. Chris does a great job with these every day. Sends you written position previews, the latest news, and much more. Again, it's free and delivered right to your inbox, cbssports.com slash newsletters, or scan the QR code if you're watching on YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, if you're watching us live right now, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, and if you aren't watching us on YouTube, what are you waiting for? YouTube.com slash fantasy baseball today. Make sure to subscribe. Hit the notification bell. March is going to be... Very, very important. I mean, February is already important, but March is a little bit more important. Uh, we're going to be doing live mock drafts, breaking down spring training, and much more. Let's take our first break. When we return, I will present an argument for drafting aces and then the devil's advocate for that argument right after this. The madness doesn't just happen. Yo, get ready! And although it's marked on our calendars each year, it's built by moments of mayhem before. And the crowd goes crazy! And it begins to bubble long before it bursts. Sure, madness and March may go hand in hand, but it starts right here. Welcome back in starting pitcher preview part one. The argument for an ace, drafting an ace early in your draft. If it's harder to find elite pitching, doesn't that make the top tier more important? I could see somebody forming that argument but I would also, I'll also just play devil's advocate to my own argument here is that I don't know that there's much that separates, you know, like Strider in the first round and Garrett Cole in the second round versus, I don't know, Zach Wheeler in the third round or whatever it might be as dominant as Strider is. He had a 386 ERA last year mm -hmm. as dominant as Garrett Cole is his strikeout rate was way down as Scott pointed out. So 
Uh, I just wanted to mention that because I could see someone listening or, or mm -hmm. watching this and say, well, why don't we draft the top tier of starting pitchers if they're harder to find? And I guess yeah. the reason against it. And, and, and you know, I, I, I kind of addressed it, but maybe in a more helter skelter, skelter way. So just to drive home the point. Remember, that was the approach we were taking, or at least I was taking in 2020, coming off the height of the juice ball era in 2021, because it worked out so well in 2020. Build your team around aces. They are the scarcer commodity. The bigger drop-off happens after them. But what separates this era from that era is the aces aren't as dominant. The aces don't distinguish themselves from the rest of the pitcher ranks as much as they do. They're, they're just less dominant than past eras of aces. That's that's they're more predictable maybe than the glob, but they're not going to stand out as much from the you know further down in the pitching ranks as they might have during the juice ball era. Chris, real, uh, Scott, real quick, in terms of ADP, where where does the glob start for you? Because I mean, me just kind of eyeballing it, Sonny Gray, Verlander, Chris Bassett. That's like SP 33 to 35, that kind of feels mm -hmm. like the range, but how about for you? Yeah, that's pretty much it. That in my own rankings, it's it's around 35th. Okay. So that's that's pretty much the right. Those, those specific pitchers you named were Sonny Gray, Chris Bassett, and who else? Verlander. Verlander. I think I have them all in my in looking at my pitcher tiers in, in the start of glob tier. Now Verlander used to be outside of it, but He's had shoulder problems already this spring, so I'm, I'm, I'm considering Verlander globby at this point, and maybe I should have all along. I don't know, but yeah, that's that's about right. The 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 one thing I would say is, I, I think it's more helpful to think of, maybe think of it in terms of profiles rather than range right at least for me the way i view it is like there are pitchers who might be ranked a little higher but who are certainly not as safe and and one thing that i think a lot about is um i'm hope i'm, I'm hoping i can find the right way to put this um i don't know how familiar you guys are with the concept of the rb dead zone but it's become one of the the more fashionable discussion points when it comes to fantasy football drafting. And the idea is that basically you have your first three rounds, first two, maybe three rounds of running backs in fantasy football drafts. Historically, they, these are the best bets you can make in fantasy. And what separates them is these are the guys who have proven they can handle 250, 300 plus touches, who have proven they can be efficient, who have proven – they are on good offenses and get pass catch passes and all the things you look for. And then after that, what you have have historically happened at the running back position, and it's it's happening less now because of the RB dead zone discussion, is that everyone else gets pushed up, right? Like everyone's like, well, I still need running backs in the third and fourth and fifth and sixth rounds. So I'm going to take the guy who's projected to get 250 carries, even if he's not good, even if he has no job security. Or I'm going to take the young, exciting guy, even though there's no projection in terms of his workload. And those tend to be the worst bets you can make because running backs are an inherently volatile, high variance position. And when you, they're all bets in a certain way, right? They're all kind of low probability bets because they get hurt. They're relying on their teammates for production. Then you start adding on, yeah, but I bet this guy's going to be good. Or I bet this guy's going to get the workload. And you see what I'm doing, right? Like you see how the, the, the analogy fits pretty perfectly with starting pitcher to the point where the way I think of it is there are two things you're looking for. You're looking for good ratios. You're looking for good pitching, I guess is the way to put it. And you're looking for volume. And the guys who you feel really confident can give you both Set. like their first second third rounders whatever whatever the range yeah and then so that's proven it time and time again there's seven of them in after that in my estimation. you get like let's take tyler glass now in the third round and and like <laughs> that's not to say that tyler glass now cannot work in the third round and, and this part of the discussion is not about specific pitchers 
He's just George Kirby's another one you could say. He's gonna throw get more strikeouts. So he's gonna and that's mm. where I think once you start talking about premium picks where you're wishing on something, that is where I think if there is an SP dead zone, that's where I think you start to see it. When you start to go, yeah, but if you so might as well just not draft, you might as well so not spend an elite pick on that player. So it sounds like you are more in the camp of, you know, give me, give me a true ace. Um, I mean, I've talked about it a handful of times, but I, I think my approach is tends to be, I would love to get one of the top six, seven, whatever the number is. Zach and Allen's probably the one you, you hedge on there. I yeah, well, I, I think Pablo Lopez you can hedge on for similar reasons to Zach Gallen. I, I think like Spencer Strider. Pablo Lopez Garicole, has given us the workload once. Once, yeah. That's yeah. Zach Gallen's given us the workload kind of twice. I think 2021 he had a decent amount of innings, but he wasn't great that season, if I'm remembering correctly. And then 2022, he had the elbow issue. I would argue two years in a row for Pablo, 180 plus innings in each of the past. Oh, did he get to 180 oh, okay. innings in 2022? I thought he got hurt in 2020. I, I have him ranked as my SP7. I have him ahead of Gallon. Yeah, I have him as SP7 as well. He's done it two um, years in a row, so I'm in. So, yeah, I, I think Strider, Cole, Burns, Wheeler, Gosman, Castillo, Lopez. That That's, I think, a, I think Gallon's right there, but, you know, I, I think there are some questions with him coming off 240 innings, um, especially. Those are the guys that I feel reasonably confident about both the workload and the performance now the way this tends to work is probably two or three of them will get hurt or just be bad because it's starting pitcher mm -hmm. after that is that you start to see it Tarek Skubal Aaron no these are my rankings Tarek Skubal Aaron Nola Yoshi Yamamoto Framber Valdez Tyler Glass now like there's a lot to like about all of those they all have a gigantic if. And so I do think there, there's a specific change in the way you need to view them and the way you need to think about drafting those guys as part of your larger holistic strategy. And so when I say I want one of that top six or seven, I then what I want, and I know you guys don't really agree with this, but I want to dip back into the next tier, but only for one of the guys that I feel really good about the workload. So that would be like Framber yeah. Valdez, who I think has you know yeah, three straight seasons of the workload. Aaron Nola, his whole career basically. Logan Webb. It's not what it's well, not going to be in that range for me. Is so Tyler it's, Glass so it's now the ERA Peralta. basically like the guy? The guys who are ranked that high because they give you the workload are the yeah. guys who I think are vulnerable of receding into the glob yes. on performance. Sure, and that's what I want to avoid. And, and this is, and I think it's specifically a, a roto versus head to head. Thing. Because I think in yeah. Roto, what I want is... I'm not as fearful of the glob in head-to-head. -head. Yeah. But in, like, in Roto... The, the, what, what, really, what really kills you with the glob and those disaster starts, the random number generator, whatever you want to call it in mm -hmm. Roto, is that you undo so much so much of what you try yeah. to accomplish in ERA and whip in one fail, fell swoop. That sticks with you the rest of the season. A bad start, a disaster start, and a head-to-head -head league, okay, it messes you up one week, but you start fresh the next week. And so yeah. I, I think it's a different, like, like never, there has never been a year where my Roto starting pitcher rankings have differed so much from my head to head starting mm -hmm. pitcher rankings because of that. Yeah. Last but, but basically, oh, sorry. Yeah. But basically what I want to say is I kind of want like two pitchers in my first four or five picks in a Roto league where I feel really good about in the aggregate 370 innings, pushing for plus 400 plus strikeouts, hopefully good ratios, obviously, but you know, obviously if it's Aaron Nola, there's a little more skepticism about the ERA and I get that. But what that allows me to do is having that solid base of volume where I'm not, gosh, I hope Tarek Skubal stays healthy or gosh, I hope Tyler glass now stays healthy or, you know, is yep. it allows me to, to then dip into that pool of really, really talented guys who we really like in like the 50 to 60 to 70 range, Brian Wu and, you know, you Darvish bounce back if you want to bet on that and whoever, Michael King, it allows me to do that without those guys being here. Here's the with, problem. while having that baseline set. Here's the problem. Why I don't feel like I can do that 
is because the drop off from we, we've talked about how the drop off from the elite pitchers to the next down does not mm-hmm. feel nearly as big as it used to. The drop off from the top hitters to the next down feels huge still. It feels mm-hmm. huge. Like in my mind, there are about three, three and a half rounds worth of MVP caliber bats. And then there are like seven rounds worth of hitters that it's kind of hard to distinguish between. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that, you know, the, that the first three, three and a half rounds, those seven pitchers that we're talking about that you feel safer with are all going to go in that same range. But I, I feel like there's urgency to take hitters there. And so I've been pretty focused on drafting hitters, drafting from that, that group of MVP caliber hitters until they're all gone. And if there is like a Kevin Gosman or a, or a, I don't know, Zach Gallon there after they're all gone, great, but there usually isn't. And so I try then to, you know, recognizing the volatility of the group that follows the Tarek Skubles and Cole Reagans mm-hmm. and uh, Justin Steele types. I try to get more of them to compensate for that. I try to get four of that, four of my top 35 that we were talking about the, the, that, that are ahead of the glob. Um, but it's usually concentrated in the 15 to 35 mm-hmm range of my rankings now what i have noticed because you know normally we're talking 12 team leagues what i have noticed is that 15 team leagues you get in those real deep roto leagues it's hard to draft four pitchers from the 15 to 35 range they they, there's just they they go over too short a span of time because there's so many more teams picking and so in that format in that deeper roto format i'm kind of open to drafting like garrett cole at the end of round one Mm -hmm. just so i can you know, really make sure I get a, a stable elite pitcher and and then maybe drafting two of those in the 15 to 35 range. But that's mm-hmm. only for those 15 team leagues. Obviously, most of the people listening don't play in leagues that deep. And Frank, I know you want to move on, but I do want to just point out one more thing and it won't take long. But I, I think one key distinction, this is just a philosophical thing, is my strategy this year is very similar to what my strategy has been the last five years. Cause it's, it's very much informed by historical data and it's possible that I'm just wrong, right? That this, that last year did represent a sea change and, but my, my pitching staffs were pretty good last year across my, my Roto team. So that, that's, but that that is one distinction is that I'm still basic on historical draft trends where, the first three or four rounds of starting pitcher tend to be where the best values. And then the distinction between five and 13 is a lot smaller than you think. And and that was also true last year as well. I think that's a good point, Chris. I know that the data shows that early round pitchers are much more likely to provide return on investment. The problem is that I think the same historical data shows that hitters in the early rounds are even more likely Mm -hmm. to return investment than the early round pitchers are. Mm-hmm. So there's a give and take there. What do you want to do? And maybe these are famous last words, but the ADP this year, it feels like the rounds three through seven starting pitchers are better than they have been in years past. I don't know if that's just like not much of a differentiation between mm-hmm. the, the top tier pitchers, whatever it might be. I, I think your RB dead zone analogy is a really good one, but something I noticed in fantasy football this year is that if everyone starts thinking that way, yeah, absolutely, it does start to push running backs down and yes. you can find good values. And look, obviously there's always going to be diamonds in the rough, like whatever. Brees Hall was like a third or fourth round pick. Mm-hmm. And he was awesome. Not that anyone cares about fantasy football. But no, but, but but you're right. That that is a that is a trend that I think RB values have gotten better as we've gotten smarter about drafting them. And I don't know if we could ne- t- technically say that about starting pitchers, but mm-hmm. at least it feels that way on the sure. surface, right? Like you guys talked a little bit about your strategy. I, I kind of, I'm kind of a blend, I guess, of both of you guys where like if Zach Wheeler or Luis Castillo or Kevin Gossman falls to the right point in round three, where it makes sense, mm-hmm. then I will take them. Or if it's just, if I start three hitters in a row, which I've done in a lot of drafts, it kind of feels like Logan Webb is just a great value in round yep. four where he's going right now. It's just, you know, the argument against George Kirby is, Hey, Logan Webb is there around later. Yeah, so very, very Kirby. similar players. And then I usually like to double up. If you take a Logan Webb, you can kind of pair him with a strikeout upside pitcher like a Freddie Peralta or a mm-hmm. Kodai Sango or a Blake Snell, someone like that. And then usually I like to jump in 
Um, you know, I like to get three of my top 30. So like SP3, someone like a Bobby Miller or a Yuri Perez. You know, if you took some risk with your first two pitchers, maybe you take like a Zach Eflin or a Justin Steele. Those guys feel a little bit safer. So that's me. I like to take three of my top 30, but I, you guys have already kind of broken down your strategy, right? We can move on. We're good. We're good I think that. so. I mean, we could probably do a whole podcast on pitching <laughs> strategies, <Sure can>. but, <laughs> but that's fine. Let's, let's, let's look. We at only ADP. have, we only have like three more hours to talk about starting pitchers <laughs> over the next two and a half episodes guys. And I should have mentioned up top, I was okay going longer with strategy today because we're doing three podcasts worth of just starting pitchers. So again, we'll try and get through the top 20 today. And, and then- it's half the game. It's half the game. Basically pitchers are half the game and they have jerked us around so much over the years. I am. And there's a lot to look at when they're they, pitchers. They drove me crazy last year, Frank. They, they drove me crazy. With all the, oh, the random number. Gender. Ah, all right. All right. All right, let's take our final break. When we return into the ADP, we go here on Fantasy Baseball Today. We give thanks to the athletes who took big risks, who beat the odds despite being our balls because of their skin. But to change the status quo, you have to be willing. This is the month we remember. But more importantly, we dream of something bigger. Welcome back into Fantasy Baseball. Today, starting pitcher average draft position via Fantasy Pros, which uses five different websites, including CBS, ESPN, Yahoo, RT Sports, and the NFBC. We'll start at the top. Only one starting pitcher consistently going in the first round of 12-team leagues. Spencer Strider with an ADP of 9.6. Strider, we know, has nasty stuff. He's the best strikeout pitcher in baseball. Uh... Distant first in terms of strikeouts last year. K minus walk rate, swinging strike rate. Again, distant first in all those categories. 3.86 ERA. That's what holds Strider back. It was elevated, although each of his FIP, XFIP, Sierra, and expected ERA were either first or second among all qualified starting pitchers. So we would hope that there's maybe some better luck, some positive regression in the way of Spencer Strider this year. Why was that ERA so high? Well, his home run per nine. His home run rate in general jumped up last year. It more than doubled last season. He did struggle in the second half. Maybe that was a bit of the workload going from 134 innings in 2022 up to nearly 200 innings last year. Uh, And his fastball, while still really good, it did drop one mile per hour in uh, in velocity. So something that stood out to me there as well. Scott, Braves fan, rocking the Strider shirt. Should Spencer Strider be the first pitcher drafted? Yeah, he should. I mean, especially if you, like me, consider strikeouts to be the most reliable statistic in this environment. It's always been the most reliable statistic, but even more so in this new globby world we're living in. He had 44 strike, 44 more strikeouts than anybody else. He also had three more wins than anybody else, for what it's worth. That's the most valuable fantasy stat, not the most predictable, but he pitches for a Braves team that scores a lot of runs. So in theory, if he's pitching all those innings again, he should be a really good source of wins. Uh, But, you know, there are downsides. Obviously, he's only taken on that ace workload once so far, and so he hasn't proven he can do it again and again like a Garrett Cole can. And what is going on with the ERA? I, I would like to think it's mostly bad luck. Probably is mostly bad luck. But I will point out, Strider was, this is the stat I was referring to earlier that I looked up and then never shared. The the top four finishers in expected ERA, uh, according to to StatCast, this is minimum 400 balls in play, so I'm, I'm only doing guys who took on a big workload. Top four finishers in expected ERA, their actual ERA was about half a run higher for all of them. They were Pablo Lopez, Zach Wheeler, Zach Eflin, and Spencer Strider. So part of it is just, I don't know that this environment allows for an ERA that low. But part of it too is Strider throws two pitches, fastball, mm-hmm. slider. And he doesn't seem that interested in expanding the arsenal. Uh, there there, have been questions asked of him this spring. It sounds like he's sticking with fastball, slider. And so on days when maybe the slider on days when maybe the fastball isn't quite at its very best or even individual innings where this fastball isn't at its very best because 
as somebody who watched a lot of Strider starts, I can tell you he'd be cruising four or five innings, and then he'd just hit a wall one inning and end up with a crooked ERA for that one start when he had been dominating up until that point. I think it's just... And maybe it's a hump he can get over without developing a new pitch, but it's he can just be a little predictable if his if he doesn't bring his A game. His A game is next to unhittable, but if it if it slips into A minus B plus territory, uh, things can unravel for him. All right, the SP two in ADP is Garrett Cole at pick thirteen. So at times, is slipping into the second round here in drafts. He's coming off his first Cy Young award. Cole is a dependable workhorse. He has the most innings pitched since 2017. A big key for him was that he cut down the home runs allowed. His home run per nine went from 1.48 in 2022 to 0.86 in 2023. His home run per fly ball rate also went from 16.8% to 9.4%. Oddly enough, had his best season with the Yankees despite a pretty big drop in strikeout rate. K per nine went from 11.5 to 96 the K rate from 32% to 27%. Swinging strike rate from over 14% to 11.7% last year for Garrett Cole. Fastball velocity did drop nearly uh, just over one mile per hour. Despite all of that, arguably the best pitcher in baseball. Chris, how much do you worry about the underlying numbers with Garrett Cole? I, I don't really even think about it. <laughs> uh, just like, all right, I, let's move on. Well, I just... I. I think we overthought Garrett Cole last year when I was like, well, his ERA is kind of high and he can't stop giving. And I, I think it's sort of like we, we know Garrett Cole's going to be very, very good. Will he be the number two or number one starting pitcher in fantasy? Well, he was last year, but he wasn't the year before. What we know is he's going to be great. The specific shape of it. I, I don't care that much. Like he traded some strikeouts for better home run prevention last year. And it was a sustainable change. The quality of contact that he allowed was significantly better last season than it had been the year before. What's really interesting though, is his expected Woba allowed basically identical, even though the quality of contact was better because he traded the strike. He, he threw the cutter a little bit more. He threw, um, what was the other chain? I guess the, the his curveball he threw a little bit more, I think. And and so those were pitches that allowed him to keep the ball in the yard a little better and hmm. whatever. I, like, I, I just, I don't know. I, I This is one that I think people have, he's so good so consistently and he's been good for so long that people just overthink it. And it's just, Garrett Cole's going to be great. Will he exactly live up to his price? Maybe not, but he is the, the by far, I think, the safest starting pitcher in fantasy. Yeah, I mean, I basically, I basically agree with all that, but there is that kernel of doubt. Maybe we're whistling past the graveyard because it is a drop of two K per nine, and I know I kind of wrote that off for Justin Verlander last year, and you know he won the Cy Young. He's Justin Verlander. What are we worried about? And then he ended up having not so great a year. The the you know he it, it it was it it turned out to be a start of a trend, rather than just this weird thing that happened, uh, the the loss of strikeout ability. Garrett Cole went from being one of the best strikeout pitchers in baseball to at least in terms of percentages, an, an above average strikeout pitcher. He did have the fifth most strikeouts in baseball. Yeah, I mean, that's, he's, that's... he's he's throwing a lot of innings, so an above average strikeout rate still adds up to a ton of strikeouts when you're throwing a lot of innings. I, I will say that, you know, I, I for, for the, 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 the Spencer Strider, you're probably drafting him toward the middle of round one, Garrett Cole late in round one, or maybe even early in round two. I'm more likely to draft Garrett Cole than Spencer Strider, even though I think Strider needs to rank higher. Like if, if I'm going to invest that much in a starting pitcher and I'd rather not, mm -hmm. I feel more confident with Garrett Cole ultimately just because he has done it so much. I, he, over I the last have... six seasons, he's been the number nine starting pitcher on average. He hasn't had an ER or a whip over 1.06 in that span. I don't think he's had an ERA above three, five. Like it's just, 
we've spent too much time talking about Garrett Cole <laughs> is kind of my, it's one of those like, and I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about him. It's just for me, the way I think about him, I just, he's good. He's very good. In fact, he won the Cy Young last year. I was yes. going to say, I'm not likely to take either one of Strider and Cole and it has nothing to do with them and more so just roster construction and how I like to draft. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a pitcher in rounds three, four, five, six, seven. That range is where I like to target pitch, uh, starting pitchers. After Cole, we get to Corbin Burns with an ADP of 21.6. He is the SP3 off the board. Former Cy Young winner himself was traded to the Orioles just a few weeks back, and he's entering a contract year. A big positive park shift going from Milwaukee to Baltimore. Strikeouts and walks are both going in the wrong direction over the past two years, though he did improve in the second half. Did want to point out his K minus walk rate again, while it got better in that second half, not nearly as good as it was in 2022 or 2023. So I have been more reserved about Corbin Burns all off season. I understand why people might elevate him now that he's going from Milwaukee to Baltimore. Again, it's a better ballpark. It's presumably a better team to be on as well. Uh, but I still do have my concerns. Uh, Scott is Corbin Burns, the clear cut SP three. Yeah, I mean, I think the trade to the Orioles made him that. I, I I had him fifth before that. I wasn't as worried as you were. I mean, to go from a 1.14 whip and 8.6K per nine in the first half to 0.99 whip, 10.2K per nine. I mean, those second half numbers are unquestionably an ace. And I'd be a little more worried if it was reversed. Oh, maybe Corbin Burns, he has something going on physically that hasn't been reported or whatever. But the, the fact that he ended on with, on his highest note, I think uh, it relieved a lot of those concerns for me. And then the move to Baltimore, yeah, going to a team that huh, won over 100 games last year. And I don't know that they'll win the same number of games, but I, I think they're better now. They are mm -hmm. they have more experience for their young guys. They've acquired Corbin Burns. I think they're better now. So that'll help his win potential. And yeah, getting away from the American family field. He had a 428 ERA at home last year. And okay, maybe that's because he wasn't striking out as many guys. No, for his career, his ERA has been 75 points higher at home than on the road. And a lot of those road venues that he was pitching in weren't even as good as Camden Yards is now with the, the very deep left field fence. So yeah, I think... Uh, I think Corbin Burns becomes an obvious number three. I still think he's a distant number three and that he, in my mind, should be drafted a whole round later than Garrett Cole, if not more. But he is now the clear number three is, is Corbin Burns. All right. After Corbin Burns, we make our way into the third round of a 12-team league where we find Zach Wheeler, Kevin Gosman, and Luis Castillo, all with similar ADPs. Uh, Zach Wheeler... At pick 26 on average, he is the fourth starting pitcher off the board. Like Strider, a bit of an inflated ERA for Wheeler, 3.61, though he posted the best walk rate and best swinging strike rate of his career. He continues to rely heavily on his four-seam fastball and the sinker. Velocity on both of those pitcher, uh, pitches still look completely fine. He introduced a new sweeper last year that he used 12% of the time, and it was a great pitch for him. 198 batting average against a 39% whiff rate. Wheeler is getting up there a bit in age. He turns 34 in May, but entering a contract year, there have been some talks. Maybe he'll extend before the season even starts. Chris, I have Wheeler as my SP3 behind Strider and Cole, and he's really the first pitcher I want to start considering just because of the floor, the upside, and where he goes in drafts, sometimes early to middle part of round three. Yeah, I do think Corbin Burns is closer to number two than number four, just the way I rank it personally, but there there's really no case against Zach Wheeler. Like he has missed roughly 10 starts over the past six seasons after having a lot of issues staying healthy early on in his career. So I don't really have any concerns there. I think he's an ace in terms of the workload. I think he's an ace in terms of the, the ratios that you're likely to get. I would bet on his ERA getting around a half run better from the three, six, one mark that he posted last season. I don't really have any knocks on Zach Wheeler. I just, I think Corbin Burns in Camden yards is better, but I think Cor uh, Zach Wheeler is a, a perfectly fine bet as the number four SP off the board. 
Well, let's talk about Kevin Gosman then, who is the SP5 going just behind Zach Wheeler. 28.8 is the ADP. He's been very dependable over the past three years. The third most strikeouts in baseball during that span. Velocity and pitch mix looks fine for Kevin Gosman. For some odd reason, his swinging strike rate dropped from 15.5% in 2022 to 12.9% in 2023. That was despite the strikeout rate actually going up. So not really sure how I explain that one. Uh, he does have a higher whip than you expect from an ace. Uh, 1.18 last year, 1.24 in 2022. Scott, how much does that worry you? And Maybe worry isn't the right word, but how much does that creep into your mind when drafting Kevin Gosman? The fact that his whip is a little bit higher, does that maybe mean you can't pair him with someone like a Blake Snell or a Kodai Senga later on because that could just really be terrible for your whip? Nope. And I don't want to sound un unsophisticated, but All right. <laughs> I'm going to double down on what I said before. I care way more about strikeouts than ERA and whip. I think it's going to be way more predictable in, in this environment, especially. And, you know, it's not like, it's not like Gosman's going to be bad at ERA and whip in all likelihood. He's going to be a net benefit at both. And he's going to give you he's, a... he's consistently been bad in whip. Yeah. His whip. That's the bad. one place. 1.24, 1.18 the past two seasons. If you're yeah. drafting a pitcher as in the top five in ADP and he gives you a 1.18 whip or worse, yeah. that's bad. 1.18 whip, it, it, given uh, given how much the league whip changed last it's year? Re it's, relative last year? To, it's relative to where he's being drafted, though. Like If he's the SP15 off the board, that's fine. Yeah. But as the fifth starting pitcher off the board, that's hurtful. Yeah, like Corbin I'll, Burns, Garrett Cole. I'll Corbin Burns, Garrett Cole, Spencer Strider. Zach Wheeler, last year at least, they were all clearly better than the number one team in WHIP when you look at the, the results from last year. 1.153 was the number one team on average. Kevin Gosman was more like number three. And the thing that makes that tough is that's your best guy, right? Like that's supposed to be the, the anchor of your staff. And so I, I do think it's, it's enough to knock him down. I, I think he, you know, he tends to live sub 190 innings when all these other guys tend to be above that. That's different for Spencer Strider, but he's going to get 50 more strikeouts than Kevin Gosman. And, and I do think there is Kevin, Kevin Gosman had the second most strikeouts in baseball, right? I, I think what I was about to say is I think there is reason to believe he will regress last next season because 31.1 is his career high. In 31.1% strikeout rate is his career high outside of 2020. We know not to count that. Um, and look, the, the differences are relatively small, but I just, I think you're better off assuming 210 to 230 strikeouts than 240. Like, I mean, he had a 1.04 whip in 2021. Right. Yeah. That, it was, you know. It's within yeah, his He team. had the 20th best whip among qualifiers last year. He had the second most strikeouts. It's a relative week. He had the to be fair seventh best ERA. I have Gosman ranked as a top five starter in both formats. I, not, I know, like I don't, I don't know why people are so down on Gosman. Like the pitchers list guys were giving me grief about Gosman too. I, I don't, I don't know what it is. I think he's, I think he's an ace. I think he's, he's like he's proven it three years in a row. I, I would mostly agree. I, I just think if you take him, you do have to be a little bit more cognizant about who your SP two or SP three is. Because of the whip, but um, maybe that just bounces back and he has like yeah. a whip here. I mean, I, I guess I personally don't ever draft a pitcher with this good of a whip as Gosman had. So I don't know. I guess I have a different standard for that. All right, let's talk about Luis Castillo also in this range. 31.6 is the ADP. He's the sixth starting pitcher off the board. He's been very consistent since joining the Mariners. 44 starts since joining the team. A 329 ERA, a 1.1 whip. 296 strikeouts over 262 and a third innings during that time, a 14.5% swinging strike rate. He's also become a different pitcher over the years. He doesn't rely as much on ground balls or his changeup. He throws more fastballs, and he does have one of the best four-seam fastballs in all of baseball. He also has much better control than he did in years past with the Reds. The only concern might be that he does allow a lot of hard contact and that each of his FIP, XFIP, Sierra, and XERA tell us he deserved something more like a 3.8 ERA. Mm -hmm. With that said, Chris, Luis Castillo is one of these proven aces. 
again, I'm, I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth. I do like him. I like him as a top six or seven starting pitcher. I think he's fine. Yeah, I, I think he's a much less sure thing for a very, very good ERA than Kevin Gosman, for example. Like, I, I feel... I feel better about Kevin Gosman's ERA floor than I do Luis Castillo's because Luis Castillo last year, at least had a real problem with home runs. Like you said, he, he gave up a lot of hard contact, 28 home runs last season. So I, I do think, you know, the, the strikeout rate is good. It's not elite. The walk rate is good. It's not elite. So it's like, he's kind of, I, I think, in terms of skill set, maybe a, a step down from the guys we're talking about ahead of him, but he's been relatively healthy, all things considered. I think 2022 is the only time he's been on the IL in his career, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, he only made 25 starts in 2022, right? Yeah, yeah, he had the shoulder to start the year. So that, Outside of that, he's been very, very consistent and very, very healthy. I, I think the home run rate probably knocks him down a little bit, but it's also a great park, and he hasn't had that issue in the past, so I I think it's okay to write it off, and, and he belongs in this range. I, I think he's very, very good. After Castillo, we get to Zach Gallen, whose ADP is 35.8. He's the seventh starting pitcher off the board. And Gallen had a great year last year, but, and I doubted him last year, he made me eat my words, 11.2% swinging strike rate is the lowest among the seven names that we've talked mm -hmm. about so far. He allows a lot of hard contact as well, 91.5 mile per hour, average exit velocity, that was in the third percentile. Gallen's expected ERA was 4.16. He did take a step back in the second half, his ERA was over four, he had a 121 whip, and he threw a ton of innings, as we mentioned at the top, 243 and two-thirds innings for Zach Gallen last year. He was asked about the innings when he reported to camp last week, and he had this to say, quote, it doesn't have to be 210 innings. It can be, mm -hmm. hey, maybe let's just peel an inning off here because they want we want to save, you know, 10 innings for the postseason. So it's something they're cognizant of. Maybe, you know, he doesn't throw as many seven or eight inning starts, whatever, and it's just like they'll just cap him at six innings. But the fact that it's in their mind is at least kind of interesting for me. Uh, Scott, I personally have a pitcher who's lower in ADP ahead of Zach Gallen, which means I, I don't think I'm going to wind up with a lot of him this year. Yeah, he's kind of a an untrendy pick, it seems like, among the, the, the fantasy eggheads and... Um, I get it to a certain degree, but I, I feel like we've been fighting this battle or certainly I've been fighting this battle with Zach Gallen for, for three years now. I mean, yes, he doesn't have a great swinging strike rate. He did have his best swinging strike rate in three years. So like, while a lot of the aces were becoming less with tastic. He was becoming more with tastic and, um, you know, uh, his FIP was three twenty six. You mentioned that the, the XERA was really high. Uh, he got to being a elite con control pitcher probably for the first time when that was in, in the minors. That was what stood out for Zach Gallon the most. It was kind of strange how how many guys he walked once he reached to the majors. He finally got to where he was throwing strikes like he did in the minors. And, uh, you know, was in Cy Young contention right up until the last couple weeks of the season. So... I think it's probably another instance where we're overthinking it. Mm -hmm. And Zach Gallen is, you know, I, I can't tell you whether his ERA is going to be mid twos like in 2022 or mid threes like in 2023, but I think the sum of his contributions will be very, very positive. And, uh, you know, definitely uh, feel a lot better than I did about Zach Gallen now than when he was coming off that elbow issue in 2021. And we were thinking he was all going to have Tommy John surgery. That seems to be not at all in the, in the, and in on the that topic anymore. It feels a little heads. I win tails. You lose with Zach Gallen, where it's like last year, it was like, Oh, but we don't know if he can do the workload of an ACE. And then this year he gives us the workload of ACE. And it's like, Oh, now we don't know how he's going to And it's like, it, it it feels a little unfair, but I, I do think there are legitimate question marks with with Zach Allen in terms of like 
why were his peripherals so bad last season? You know, like that, that's, I think like, why was he so bad at quality of contact last year? That's a stat that takes a really long time to stabilize sudden year to year changes. Probably shouldn't overreact one way or the other. He was elite in 2022. He was pretty bad in 2023. I think he'll probably about be about average there. And if you combine that with really good command and good, not great strikeout rates, it's probably a low to mid three ZRA. And I don't know how concerned we should be about the health at this point. So I think he's fine where he goes. I, I think he's probably the least likely of these guys to be on my team. And there is entirely a world where he makes me look dumb two years in a row. So <laughs> I will completely acknowledge that I'm a little bit more worried about the workload, but again, um, could make me look stupid. Pablo Lopez, the ADP, is 38.6 as the eighth starting pitcher off the board. He got traded to the Twins last offseason and revamped the pitch mix. He introduced a new sweeper that he used 21% of the time. It was a great pitch for him. He increased the fastball velocity from 93.5 miles per hour to 94.9 miles per hour last year. He ranks very highly in metrics that... We like to use for starting pitchers, 14.5% swinging strike rate. That was fourth best among qualified starters. 23.2% K minus walk rate, third best. 3.00 XERA, the best among qualified starting pitchers. But as Scott pointed out, I don't know. Maybe maybe he won't live up to that expected ERA. Uh, did have some shoulder issues in the past, but has now thrown 180 plus mm -hmm. innings in back-to-back -back seasons. I would take Pablo Lopez over Zach Gallen. I I think it's close enough in ADP, um, but I, yeah, it's like a fair argument. Chris, your thoughts on Pablo Lopez? Yeah, hasn't missed a start in two seasons. Uh, in, in his last two seasons, was one of the best pitchers in baseball last year by the various, you know, whatever, whether you want to go XERA or FIP or Sierra, whatever, like pretty much unanimously ranked as a top five guy. He doesn't pitch in a park that you would expect to be a park where he would underperform his peripherals. His quality of contact marks are really good. I I do think Pablo Lopez deserves to be ahead of Zach Allen and, and a decent bit ahead of Zach Allen. In my overall rankings, it's like five spots, so I guess that's not really that big of a difference. But liar, given the ADP, <laughs> given that Zach Allen goes ahead, I'm I'm much more likely to take Pablo Lopez, and I'm much more excited about it. I think the underlying skill set that he showed last season is much stronger. All of his pitches, pretty much, and he, he throws five of them, but four of them more than 10% of the time. All of them besides the sinker are very good swing and miss pitches, and none of them are bad quality of contact pitches. So I don't know. I, I think there's a world in which Pablo Lopez is the number one pitcher in fantasy, and I don't know how many pitchers behind him I can say that about. So I, I do think we need to acknowledge Pablo Lopez is the first pitcher we've mentioned who's been a fantasy ace just once, just mm -hmm. last year. Um, we did discuss, okay, he's giving you an ace workload two years in a row. But last year was the first year where he gave you an ace workload and an ace strikeout rate. And the strikeout mm -hmm. rate, I think there's a good explanation for it at a velocity and maybe even more so the sweeper. Uh, so he has the sweeper and the changeup now who can, that can get him swings and misses. I'm hopeful it can sustain but you know he, he's not as proven as any of the other guys mm -hmm. we've talked about he's not as proven as zach gallon even so i guess that's why i'm the holdout when it comes to ranking zach gallon ahead of pablo lopez still i've moved pablo lopez up so that he's in that same tier now um it begins with corbin burns and uh continues even through yoshinobu yamamoto but um but yeah, I think Pablo Lopez, in terms of how proven he is, you know, we've, we've only seen him do it once. Mm -hmm. It's worth noting. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about George Kirby. Have that conversation. The ADP is 42.2 as the ninth starting pitcher off the board. The best control in all of baseball. He walked 19 batters over 31 starts. 0 0.9 walks per nine. Very clearly the best among qualified starting pitchers. His 104 whip over 190 and two-thirds innings was the third best whip contribution in fantasy last year. George Kirby has a great fastball, which gained nearly one mile per hour. Uh, went from 95.3 miles per hour in 2022 to 96.1. But the strikeouts are not there like other aces. Both his K per nine 
and swinging strike rate, ranked 32nd among 44 qualified starting pitchers. Uh, strikeout rate did jump to uh, a K per inning in the second half, which coincided with throwing more splitters. Maybe he could unlock even more in 2024. Uh, but Chris, this is one of those pitchers where you kind of have to talk yourself into it. Yeah, but the strikeouts are going to come. And that's mm -hmm. why he's going to be a top 12 starting pitcher. Um, I think the ratios are still going to be good, but we do still have questions whether or not those strikeouts will be there. Yeah, I mean, one thing that, that is worth keeping in mind is the ERA was 335. The XERA was 390. Yeah. last season the quality of contact metrics for george kirby are not as good as you would expect I, I think a lot of people tend to assume that good command equals good quality of contact metrics and i think a, a good example of a guy like that was kyle hendricks but those that's not necessarily the case and i think you can reach a point of diminishing returns when it comes to limiting walks in a way that leaves you liable to to being too hittable because you're in the strike zone too much and maybe the splitter is the way that george kirby gets around that and it can, can become more of a swing and miss pitch i think the the arguments in favor of george kirby being you know in, in some cases a top five starting pitcher some people have him ranked i think they they rely on at times sort of tortured logic um, like, oh, the strikeout rate was up in the second half. Kind of. Like, it was. But it was really, he had three starts at the start of the second half where he struck out 26 batters over the course of 16 innings. His next 10 starts, he had 53 strikeouts in 62 innings. His strikeout rate immediately went right back to about 22%. Maybe the splitter changes that. I don't know, but it just... I think he's a high floor pitcher. And if you want good ratios, really great whip, I think George Kirby's a good bet to give you that. But well, I, I think we're we're assuming a lot in putting him in the fantasy ace tier when it's a very limited repertoire of pitches. He he technically throws five or six pitches. Maybe this again, I think a lot of it comes down to can the splitter be that pitch he can go out of the strike zone with. If it can be, then I think he he does have another level. But I think he's a lot closer to Brant uh, to Logan Webb than he is to Luis Castillo. I'd rather have Logan Webb. I don't get this ranking. I don't get this ranking for. I didn't get his ranking last year. I don't get his ranking this year. I don't get. I don't get what the deal is with George Kirby because he's not much of a strikeout pitcher. He did have a very, you know, he is a great control pitcher. He's one of the best control pitchers. He had a great whip last year. He also gives up a lot of hits. He's very hittable. His, mm -hmm. you know, as, as for as good as his control is, his whip in 2022 was 1.21 because he gives up so many hits. And he gave a lot of hits last year too. It wasn't quite as many, so the whip ended up being good. But if you're not a strikeout pitcher and First of all, in this environment, again, I don't trust ERA and whip contributions that much to begin with, but I I think people are assuming a little too, like, I, I guess the, the enthusiasm, oh, yeah, I, I get George Kirby as my ace and I never have to worry about whip again, but I, I don't think that's true. I think I, I think there's a lot more vulnerability there than people are factoring in. For those that are listening to the podcast, I just have to describe when Chris <laughs> mentioned that some people have uh, Kirby ranked as a top five starting pitcher. Scott's face was covered in pain, just shaking his head, just in pain, hearing that Kirby well, could even rank that high. Like, so, I, that's funny. I want to, like, it felt like for a half decade, Kyle Hendricks would consistently perform at a super high level. And nobody took him seriously. And Kirby's a better strikeout pitcher, although relative to league average, I think the gap between him and, and like Kyle Hendricks first breakout is probably not as big as you think, but it's just weird. It's weird that Kyle Hendricks broke out in 2016 with a 2.13 ERA. And I don't know if he was ever drafted this high. It, it's a, it's a weird thing. I don't, I, I, 
It's worth Kirby, mentioning it's like that ten that, miles per hour difference on the fastball. Yeah, I mean, sure, <laughs> that's fine, but there are, there are huge differences. But does that actually matter? Like, we, in terms of like, like for projecting, Kyle but, Hendricks, it kept working though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, Kirby is young enough yeah. where, look, he's twenty six years old and he had the prospect pedigree, so I think people can talk themselves into okay, he's going to get better. Like, he, I don't know where, I don't know where the strikeouts are going to come. Maybe it's a splitter. I do find it weird that. None of his breaking pitches get whiffs, really. Mm-hmm. Like, I just, I've moved Kirby down a little bit. It's basically him and Logan Webb back to back for me in the rankings. And again, it's if I can get Webb around later, why, why wouldn't I just do that? Yeah, I don't think yeah. any of us are going to draft Kirby. It doesn't sound like there are way too many people who are high on him. Yeah. And, and by the way, an Kyle Hendricks coming off a 216 ERA, his ADP was 66.5. Two full rounds later than George Kirby. Let's go. Kyle Hendricks, baby. We are the official uh, Kyle Hendricks podcast. Tyler Glass now, 43.6 ADP as the 10th starting pitcher off the board. Traded to the Dodgers this offseason for Ryan Pepio and outfielder Johnny DeLuca. Obviously, the team context is better with the Dodgers than it is with the Rays. But it is a pretty big negative park shift. Wanted to point that out. The Dodgers are first in home run park factor in Tropicana Field in Tampa Bay. It's 18th. Tyler Glass now does allow a lot of hard contact. So just wanted to get that out of the way. We know the deal with Glass now. He's nasty among starting pitchers with 120 innings last year. Second in K per nine. Second in K minus walk rate. Second in swinging strike rate. Seventh in stuff plus, you know, Saris's metric. Uh, but he's never thrown more than 120 innings in the regular season. Uh, the good news for last year, I guess, good news is, that it wasn't an arm-related injury. It was only an oblique injury. Uh, but yeah, 120 innings last year. Scott, do you take your injury risk with Glass now in the fourth round? Or do you maybe save it for later in the draft for someone like Carlos Rodon or Chris Sale? You could say that you want to take all of them and, and just take on all the risk and have all the mm-hmm. upside. But I think that would be pretty scary. Uh, what do you think about the risk yeah. versus war with Tyler Glass now? Well, I do have Glass now behind three pitchers we haven't mentioned yet, so I guess I'm lower on him than ADP. And I, I, I don't, I can't recall a time I've drafted him yet. He does fit kind of my, my, the, my uh, focus at starting pitcher this year. Just draft for strikeout upside and let the chips fall where they may. Okay, Glass now fits with that model. But even so, you know. It's hard not to build in exceptions for any model. And a career high of 120 innings from a pitcher in his he's in his 30s now, right? He's 30. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he's 30 on the on the nose. I mean, that's that is such an extent that's an extensive track record of sitting more than you're pitching. And that's it's hard to derive value from that. Pitch for pitch, I'm convinced Tyler Glass now is the second best second most dominant starting pitcher. Like if we were just ranking these pitchers in terms of fantasy upside, it'd be Strider one glass. Now two. Yeah, he's basically Spencer Strider. Yeah. And, like, and, and now he's pitching for the Dodgers. So even yeah. better. I, but yeah, I, this is the struggle, right? Last year, he was the number 20 starting pitcher in 120 innings. The ATC projections have him as number eight in 138 innings. The problem is he hasn't thrown 138 innings in a season since 2018. He got there in 2018. When you combine the majors and the minors, combine majors and minors last year, including the minors, he got to 135.1. So maybe it's not asking too much, but it's just, and I'm, I struggle because then I see people on Twitter, uh, uh, Vlad Sedler at Roto gut on Twitter from, uh, FTN Fantasy tweeted, what if Tyler Glass now throws 180 innings? And everyone's response was, it's impossible. He'll never do it. And I think that's silly as well. (laughs) It is extremely unlikely Tyler Glass now throws 180 innings. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. And this is one of my bugaboos about the way people talk about injuries and they treat unlikely things as if they're impossible. Tyler Glass now is probably among the top 50 starting pitchers, the biggest health risk that still doesn't mean he can't throw hundred innings, 80 innings, just like Sandy Alcantara this time a year ago was by far the safest 
of the starting pitchers in terms of volume, he is not pitching this year. Mm -hmm. We are not as good as predicting these things as we think. And so no. I am unlikely to draft Tyler Glass now. I have been pretty critical of his price. Mm -hmm. The upside, it's so obvious what the upside is, that if he throws 160 innings, he's probably a huge profit. And, and 160 and let, is not that much and let for me every other pitcher. The case for why, even though I'm a little lower than the consensus on Tyler Glass now, I still have him in my top 12. I could still take him as my ace, in theory, is because in this globby world we're living in, he is decidedly not mm -hmm. globby. Like, he may only give you 15 starts. They are going to be impactful starts. You can take that to the bank. And that uh, that goes whether you're talking head-to-head -head leagues or mm -hmm. roto leagues, but especially roto leagues. He, you bank his ratios. Okay, you may have to scrap things together at some point to make up for his loss, but at least you've banked really good ratios for the half season or so that he pitches. And I, of course, there's no guarantee he even gives you 15 starts. Right. So. <laughs> Yeah, it is tough. I, I think even tougher to do in a deeper league. So obviously, mm -hmm. keep that in mind, if you play in a 15-team league, it's harder to take on risk like that. If you play in a 10-team league or a 12-team points league, the replacement value is better. So if Tyler Glass now goes down, obviously better free agents for you to choose from. Glass now, I think, is a pitcher. I, I like to come up with these combos in my head in like a categories league where if you take Glass now, why don't you pair him with like a Logan Webb or a Framber Valdez, just someone who's proven workloads 180 190 plus innings consistently and, and it it just feels like it makes sense like those two pitchers make sense to draft together one last point on tyler glass now i was listening to an interview he did with uh the fair territory foul territory foul, foul territory. territory yeah it, it's they do a great job i i'd like to tune tune into their player interviews tyler glass now said he was only throwing 120 innings last year regardless like the Rays told him, you're only throwing 120 innings. So I maybe I'm not gonna say that they like faked an injury or whatever it was, but like he still got hurt. <laughs> he might have he might have been like shut down at some point anyway, because they were like, You're only throwing 120 innings this year, because he was coming back from injury. Just mm -hmm. thought I'd throw that out there. It's kind of interesting. Uh from let's go over to Aaron Nola. His ADP is 46 points. 46.6 as the 11th starting pitcher off the board and signed a seven year, $172 million contract this off season to return to the Phillies. This dude is a proven workhorse has the second most innings and third most strikeouts since 2018. The most frustrating part is the ERA over the past three years. It's been 446, 325 and 463. You add it all up. That's a 4.09 ERA since the start of 2021. My only explanation is that when things go wrong for Nola, they go really wrong. And maybe that's because he just pitches with lower velocity than other so-called aces, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he throws like 92, 93 miles per hour. So yeah. again, like when things go wrong for Nola, they go really wrong. Uh, I think he works better in a head-to-head -head points league because of the volume, but I'm staying yes. away in categories leagues. Roto. Yep. Any like top 12 well, starting pitcher ADP for me, Scott, in a categories league, it's too high. Yeah, Aaron Nola has has one of the biggest disparities in my points league rankings and and roto rankings because you know it's it's really just that ERA right and that'll hang that'll stick with you in a roto league and uh, in a head to head league. The individual starts are the kind that are only accessible to aces. I mean, just his best starts all look like ace starts, and then he has these ugly starts that inflate his ERA. And you could say, okay, Aaron Nola was just a, a victim of the environment. A lot of what a lot of pitchers dealt with last year, these blow up starts where he allows eight earned runs, except it's been two of the last three years where he's done it. And that's really, that's really the hard, the part that's hard to get past for me. Two of the last three years in ERA in the four or five range from a supposed ace. It's, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow. The year in between that ERA was 325. And he really was like a, the, the truest form of ace. You mentioned you, your theory for why he struggles, I think, is spot on. Like his fastball, he has to locate it properly because the velocity is lower, narrow margin for error. And and he actually talked about this heading into the postseason last year. He was, he was good in the postseason. Um, he thought he was living too much in the middle of the plate during the season and was better at hitting the corners. Okay, guy has pristine control. Maybe he can keep that up for a full year. But I think he's shown twice now that it's easier said than done. And 
he's enough of an ERA liability that I'm not going to draft him this range of Roto. I, I thought he would be lower than this and he would be affordable. And I was looking forward to that, but uh, ADP has proven that is not so. And people are t- still valuing Aaron Nola like an ace. I would need, I would need him more into like in like the 15 to 20 range at starting pitcher to draft him in Roto again, points league, a different story. Uh, 10 to 15 works for me in points leagues. All right. The fifth round of ADP includes seven names. Let's see how many we can get to here in the final 10 minutes. Max Freed, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, Logan Webb, Tarek Skubal, Framber Valdez, Freddie Peralta, and Blake Snell, who remains a free agent. Let's talk about Max Freed. The ADP is 50 as the 12th starting pitcher off the board. And he's always been great, but he has elevated his game over the past two years. 44 starts during that span, a 250 ERA, a 105 whip, just under a strikeout per inning. He has great control, limits hard contact, gets a ton of ground balls. He's become a more complete pitcher uh, last year as well. He's you know started throwing uh, more. He has like five different pitches he throws over 10% of the time. He has tremendous run support with the Braves, obviously. Chris, my only hesitation with Max Freed is that he was limited to 77 and two-thirds innings last year due to multiple injuries, including a strained left forearm, sometimes something that could lead to, you know, a bigger injury down the line. Yeah, I mean, you you said, like, if we can get through the these next seven or whatever, but, like, the nice thing is there's, like, three or four different versions of the same pitcher within <laughs> this because, like, Max Freed, Framber Valdez, and Logan Webb are all very similar. And Freddie Peralta and Blake Snell are kind of Spider-Man meme-y, too. So we could just group all those guys. Freed is a really, really good pitcher. I don't think there's any question about it. And when he was missing time with blisters and hamstrings, it was easy to write off. And I think those were primarily the issues before that forearm issue over the past couple of years. Missing three months with a strained forearm is a big concern because forearm injuries often, though not always, lead to elbow issues. On the other hand, he had a 2.79 ERA over his final nine starts. He threw at least 100 pitches three times in that span. There's risk here, but we don't have like a long track record of arm or elbow injuries for him. We just have the one that happened last year and is very, very concerning. Mm -hmm. But I think if Max Fried stays healthy, he's going to be a really good pitcher. You're going to get an ERA in the low threes, if not lower. You're going to get very, very good whips. I think there's a lot to like about him. I personally have him a little bit lower than the other two versions of him in this same tier, which are Logan Webb and Framber Valdez, but I don't have any problem with Max Freed. It's just a question of whether he's worth the risk. I have two problems with Max Freed. Not enough strikeouts. That's the problem I have with most pitchers if I have a problem with them. Not enough innings. I mean, even if even if we're writing off the time missed to the forearm issue last mm-hmm. year as a fluke, which we shouldn't, only once has Max Fried even thrown 170 innings yeah. in a season, which is, I have no idea why he's ranked ahead of Logan Webb for most people. I mean, you're, you're talking about Logan Webb being Spider-Man. Okay, I wish Logan Webb had a higher strikeout rate too, but at least Logan yeah. Webb takes on a lot of volume. And I'd much rather have that than, than Freed, even before you get to the fact that, oh, maybe... Maybe that forearm issue is a precursor to more. And that's why, like, I, I have Framber Valdez ahead of him as well. Um, yeah. Just because I think Framber and Logan Webb are better bets for volume. Maybe Max Fried is a better bet for ERA specifically, although even that I'm not 100% sure. Logan Webb and Framber Valdez have had pretty good ERAs themselves, even if it's not right. in that mid twos range that Fried has been the last couple of seasons. So. Yeah, I think he he's clearly behind those two, if for no other reason than they're very similar in terms of skill set, and he's a worse bet for volume. Let's talk about Yoshinobu Yamamoto, ADP of 50.8 as the 13th starting pitcher off the board. He signed a record-setting deal with the Dodgers this offseason. 12 years, $325 million, the largest contract ever for a pitcher. 25 years old, not only... Did he win Japan's version of the Cy Young Award three years in a row? He also won league MVP three years in (laughs) a row. Uh, He had a sub 1.7 ERA and a sub 0.93 whip 
in each of those three seasons. The great Eno Saris wrote an article this offseason scouting each of Yamamoto's pitches, and he came to this conclusion. Projecting forward, obviously. Top 20 fastball in the game, the best splitter in baseball, elite curveball, and elite command. Mm -hmm. Each of us have Yamamoto ranked in our top 12, but Scott, are you actually comfortable with Yamamoto as your SP1 in fantasy? Yeah, I'm more comfortable with him than I am Tyler Glass now, than I am Aaron Nola, than I am Max Freed. Uh, and and I'll, I, I will point out that, okay, the composite ADP is lower, has, has Yamamoto lower than those guys, but most of the individual websites, his ADP is higher than those guys. So mm -hmm. probably you're going to have to draft him higher than those guys. Uh, as a top 10 starting pitcher. And I think he's, I think he's worth it. Look, most decorated pitcher ever to come from Japan, even though he's just 25 years old. You mentioned the, the awards one. Yeah. I, that, you know, Saris article, he compared Yamamoto's splitter to Kevin Gossman, his curveball to Max Freed, his control to George Kirby. It was like, you know, the superlatives in each of those categories, what Yamamoto was being compared to. We have stuff plus data from the world baseball classic. Yamamoto, I believe was the second best, in stuff plus and uh you know he he unlike kodai senka coming over from japan last year yamamoto doesn't have an injury history mm -hmm. he, like he took on lots of you know six man rotations over there so it's a little different and, and he'll have to adjust to that but it's not like he has an injury history to worry about either and but so I, i'm buying into yamamoto as hard as i ever have bought into um somebody who's come over from an, another country to pitch in the majors there are there are reasons to be fearful, right? He's never thrown in Major League Baseball. That's a big one. He's never thrown a Major League Baseball in a game. They literally use a different type of baseball, I guess, in the World Baseball, the World Classic. baseball Classic. Yeah, but they use a different type of baseball in Japan. It's a smaller baseball, slightly smaller, and it's stickier. Mm -hmm. So p pitchers tend to like it more. So that that's why I think that. that WBC info is yeah. so valuable because we saw that Yamamoto, the stuff still translates without and, the and, stickier ball. And for context, the league ERA over over the last three seasons in Japan was three point two six in in the league that Yamamoto pitched in. I can't remember if it was the Eastern or the Central League, but it was. He had a one forty two ERA in that stretch. So even given the context of the league, his ERA was less than half the league average. This is a 25 year old who got the largest contract for a player who's never played a major league game ever from the smartest organization in baseball. It might go wrong, but there are lots and lots and lots of reasons to think it will go right. I'd rather have him than George Kirby. I'd rather have him than Tyler glass. Now I'd rather have him than Aaron Nola. Um, yep. A lot of the guys ahead of him. I, I would rather have, and Yamamoto. Yam Yamamoto is part of the reason, Chris, why I feel so good about this round three through six range, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you take hitters with your first three picks, we're talking about even if the ADP is on the rise, right? I'm looking at the past month at the NFBC. It's the ADP is 45, right? That's still a fourth round pick. You can take Yamamoto and then double him up with someone like Logan Webb or Framber Valdez. Again, mm -hmm. guys who are proven, who are going to give you the workload and just the ability to do that at where he goes in a draft, I I would be totally fine with him as my SP1, and then I'm likely doubling down with an SP2 right over that in drafts as well. Let's wrap up today with Logan Webb. I want to save Tarek Skubal for tomorrow because I think we have a lot to say about Tarek Skubal. Uh, Logan Webb has an ADP of 51.4. He's the SP14 off the board. He's been incredibly consistent three years in a row between a 290 and 325 ERA each year. Between a 107 and 116 whip, each year he led baseball in innings pitched 216 last year he led baseball in ground ball rate in quality starts so if you're playing a points league or any type of category league with quality starts logan webb does gain value in that format he's someone that pitches backwards his changeup is his most used pitch uh and it works for him the problems with webb we talked about them already the strikeout rate is low for an sp1 or even an sp2 uh the last two years a 7.9 k per nine over, the, over that time, it's obviously not great. But he's another one where I, I think you could pair him with guys that have strikeouts. Yamamoto mm -hmm. or Senga or Blake Snell or I don't, whoever you want to throw in this mix. Tyler Glass now, if you want to do that. Um, I think, Chris, the argument against George Kirby, again, is that you can just wait around and, and take Logan Webb. I, I really do think Logan Webb is like 
part of my main starting pitcher strategy in fantasy this year. Yeah, and I, I think there's an assumption that George Kirby has more strikeout upside than Logan Webb. And I get it to a certain extent because he does have that splitter, which is kind of an unknown factor, right? Like maybe that can that can push him to another level. We kind of forget that Logan Webb had a 27% strikeout rate in 2021. How he has not backed it up, right? 2022, it was 20.7%. Last year, 23%. So that's that's a bad thing. But like he still has a, a pretty good slider as a swing and miss pitch that I think could get back to that level potentially. He's got that changeup that's really good. We know he's really, really good at suppressing hard contact and keeping the ball on the ground. He's going to get really good results on balls and play as, as a result. So it's it's one of those situations where I get the hesitancy. I get that he's not quite as sexy as George Kirby. He's a little bit older. He maybe doesn't have the forward momentum that George Kirby does. But yeah, I I can't really make sense of the, the ADP difference is about 12 uh, spots overall, right? Yeah, it might be 10, 10 spots in ADP, but yeah, it's about a round. I think in NFBC leagues, it's even greater, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, it's about two full rounds. If you look uh, at in the, NFBC in the month of February, Kirby is going at pick 38, mm -hmm. and Logan Webb is going at 61. Yeah, so it's growing oh, what? as well. And so I... What? Who is I, George Kirby's I, publicist? I can see how you get there. I can see how you can say Kirby's entering his third season. Logan Webb is entering his sixth season at the major league level. And I don't know. I just, I don't see it. I like, I get it. I understand when people make the argument, I see the words and they all make sense, but I can't reach the same conclusion. I think Logan Webb is a, Really, really nice floor raiser for your staff in the same way that I think George Kirby is a floor raiser. And if George Kirby has a higher ceiling, I don't think the price justifies that difference. Yeah. I mean, Logan Webb, he's he's lower than in, in my Roto rankings than he might be in yours just because he's not going to give you those strikeouts that I'm selling mm -hmm. out for. But he is one of the best, if not the very best, in everything else we care about. Uh, walks, ground balls, volume. He's a more durable Max Freed. He's, uh, <laughs> you know, you've, you've compared him to George Kirby. I think that works as well. He, And, and I will point out, he is one of those pitchers who is much higher in my head-to-head points. Like, head-to-head -head points, he's an ace for me. He's 10th mm -hmm. in my head-to-head -head points rankings is Logan Webb versus... Uh, 14th in Roto. So not even as far apart as I thought. But yeah, I mean, Logan Webb. Um, if those other non-strikeout guys are being overvalued, Logan Webb's got to be, I got to say he's undervalued for sure. And for anyone who's worried about the hard contact, he does allow a lot of it, Logan Webb. It's into the ground a lot of the time. Yeah, that's, that, that's what kind of helps him. Distant first and 62% yeah. mm -hmm. ground ball rate. This is these are fan graphs numbers 62 point cent a uh, percent ground ball rate. It was 54% second place. Framber Valdez worth noting. Framber Valdez is normally closer to 60. He had kind of a down mm -hmm. year and still finished second in ground ball rate among qualifiers. But yeah, Logan Webb was way ahead of the rest of the league in that category last year. All right, we're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.